Lisa McCormick, and I'm director of the Research Education Corps for the UAB Counteract Research Center of Excellence in our Cynicals. Welcome to today's Grand Round Seminar. For those of you not familiar with our center, it is led by Dr. Muhammad Athar, and the goal of the center is to develop mechanism-based, highly effective medical countermeasures against our cynical chemical warfare agents. I want to remind you of our next virtual Grand Rounds seminar, which will take place on Thursday, December 10th at 12 noon. Dr. Will Rushton will be our speaker. Dr. Rushton is an investigator with the Research Education Corps, and he will be speaking on the identification, management, and pitfalls of thallium and organic mercury poisoning. Earlier this week, our center co-hosted with LSU Medical Center New Orleans the American College of Medical Toxicology and REACTS, a training on chemical and radiological agents of opportunity for terrorism. Links to the recording from this training will soon be available from our website, so please check that out when you get a chance. And finally, for all of you that are involved with the NIH Counteract Program, save the date, December 6th through 8th, 2021, the UAB Research Center of Excellence in Arsenicals will be hosting the NIH's annual Counteract Research Symposium in New Orleans, Louisiana. So make sure you hold these dates on your calendar now. For more information on our center or its upcoming activities, please visit our website at uab.edu slash arsenicals or send us an email at as33 at uab.edu. On the website, you will find links to all of our activities, recordings of past Grand Rounds presentations, and our podcast. And now for today's speaker, Dr. Doug Wallace. Dr. Wallace is an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at UAB. He completed his medical school training at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and his emergency medicine residency training at UAB. Dr. Wallace is the recipient of the inaugural Bob Lewis MD Resident of the Year Award. He has simultaneously completed multiple fellowships while at UAB, including a fellowship training in mass casualty incidents and global health, and the clinical practicum fellow for the UAB Research Center of Excellence in Arsenicals. Dr. Wallace has served on the UAB Disaster Management Committee and received a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene from the Gorgas course in tropical medicine. He is a contributor to multiple professional podcasts, and in 2020, he worked with leaders of the Department of Emergency Medicine to proctor a collaborative UAB School of Medicine and Federal Emergency Management Agency Disaster Management course. Dr. Wallace, Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm going to stop sharing my slides so you can be begin sharing on your end. So today I'm going to talk about chemical warfare exposures with a focus on arsenical toxicity. Our agenda today is going to be to review the classical chemical weapons syndromes and their presentations, review the history and clinical manifestations of arsenical chemical weapons specifically, utilizing lewisite as a prototype agent, and review basic chemical weapons exposure management and approach, as well as the specific management of arsenical chemical weapons exposures. So the first important aspect to understand about chemical weapons exposures is that there remains a global threat for these exposures, with the incidents of multimodal terrorist attacks and chemical weapons attacks increasing around the world. In 2018, there were greater there were 9,600 terrorist attacks and greater than 32,000 people lost their lives as a result of those attacks. And from 2010 to 2018, there were greater than 200 chemical weapons attacks around the world. So these exposures are occurring, and this is a problem we can't afford to be inadequately prepared for. There have been notable examples of chemical weapons attacks in recent years, and there are ongoing chemical weapons use in the Middle East, as well as deployment by rogue groups in civilian settings as well. A large-scale example of a chemical weapon attack occurred in Syria in April 2018 in Douma, Syria, a suburb east of Damascus. And during this attack, 42 people, including women and children, as well as were found dead, as well as greater than 500 casualties presented for medical care. Symptoms were myriad, but they ranged from trouble breathing to foaming at the mouth to burning eyes, 
with many patients requiring respiratory support and intubation. Suspected agents used were organophosphate agents, as well as chlorine gas. And here you can see a child with increased respiratory secretions, difficulty breathing, and this toxidrome in this video could be consistent with either a pulmonary agent or nerve gas exposure. And you can see some other haunting pictures of some of the victims here. Another chemical weapons exposure that occurred in recent years was the alleged assassination of Kim Jong-nam, who was the one-time heir to the North Korean leadership. And he was allegedly assassinated with the use of BX gas at Kuala Lumpur Airport in Malaysia in February of 2017. This was thought to be a prop by his younger brother, Kim Jong-un, the current Supreme Leader of North Korea. There was known deployment of chlorine gas in Iraq in April 2017 as well, um, with Islamist State jihadists employing it against Iraqi troops. And there was also known sulfur mustard use, which is a potent vesicant compound that has been combined with lewisite in the past in Aleppo, Syria in September of 2016 as part of the ongoing civil war. Again, attacks with chemical weapons around the world are ongoing. So now I'd like to transition to a discussion of conventional chemical weapons toxicomes. But in order to start that discussion, I'd like to touch a little bit on the history of chemical weapons. So chemical weapons have a very large footprint in human history. As early as 10,000 BC, rival tribes were using various poisons derived from plants and animals in battle. But modern large-scale chemical weapons use actually began in World War I with the development of chlorine gas, phosgene gas, sulfur mustard, a very potent vesicant agent, as well as lewisite and arsenical agents that were also potent vesicants. In World War II, the Nazi regime also stepped up chemical weapons production, producing newer and deadlier agents like the nerve agents. Examples include sarin, tabin, soman gas. And in more recent years, there have also been chemical weapons used by civilian groups. Probably the most large scale example of this were the Tokyo subway attacks in 1995 by the cult um, Shinriko, in which their rogue chemist leader, with the help of his group, synthesized a large stockpile of sarin gas that was deployed in the Tokyo subway system, leading to 12 deaths and over 500 casualties. And again, ongoing chemical weapons use is going on in the Middle East and abroad, and novel agents are still being developed, many of which remain classified by the US military. When we consider what makes an excellent chemical weapons agent, we want an agent that has high volatility, one that can be rapidly absorbed either through the respiratory tract or the skin, an agent that will have the rapid onset of incapacitating greater than lethal effects, and that being the case as injured casualties are going to require additional resource allocation by military forces and injuries can significantly degrade combat effectiveness. Mono or multi-agent preparations exist, an example of a multi-agent preparation is the combination of two potent vesicant agents, sulfur mustard and lewisite, an arsenical compound that we will discuss in detail today. Some are binary agent preparations as well, i.e. they require mixing of two non-lethal precursors for activation prior to deployment. An example of this is going to be VX gas, a very potent nerve agent. And most chemical weapons preparations are often a liquid that is then dispersed with the aid of an explosive device causing aerosolization, which can then be readily absorbed through the respiratory tract. When we talk about identifying classical chem chemical weapons syndrome, some big categories come to mind. One of the most prevalent and likely most important chemical weapons categories are the nerve agents. Again, sarin, tevin, soman, VX, and Novichoke gas are some of the examples of this. These agents inhibit cholinesterase, leading to increased acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, which can have numerous muscarinic as well as nicotinic effects. And clinically, that's going to manifest as increased secretions, fasciculations, and weakness with paralysis in some instances, altered mental status, seizures, plus or minus meiosis, as well as prominent bronchorrhea with marked hypoxic respiratory failure, which is actually a hallmark of the exposure. Incapacitating agents are another large chemical weapons class. And they include things like anti-muscarinic agents like BZ gas, which is also known as knockdown gas. And it causes the classic muscarinic toxidrome of madriasis, anhydrosis, flushing, delirium, tachycardia, as well as urinary retention. Essentially, these patients are going to present hot, dry, and confused. 
Another common incapacitating agent are the opioid agents, especially high dose, high potency opioid agents like remifentanil and carfentanil. Again, these agents are gonna cause prominent meiosis as well as respiratory depression, hypotension, and bradycardia. I know many of us are familiar with the toxidrome of these agents from our clinical practice. Pulmonary agents are going to be agents that can cause severe respiratory tract and mucosal irritation, as well as slopping of the respiratory mucosa, leading to hypoxemia and respiratory distress. Some notable examples are chlorine gas, phosgene gas, and hydrogen sulfide. Blood agents or asphyxiant compounds are those that inhibit cellular respiration and ATP formation. One of the most classic examples is going to be cyanide, but arsine gas as well as carbon monoxide are also asphyxiant agents. And these agents can lead to apnea, seizures, obtundation, prominent cyanosis, as well as prominent acidosis, most commonly a lactic acidosis, and these agents can have a very rapid onset of action. And that brings us lastly to the vesicant agents. There are a number of vesicant agents out there. Two of the most prominent compounds are the sulfur mustard compounds as well as arsenical compounds. These agents by definition are potent chemicals that cause severe blistering reactions in the skin and respiratory mucosa. And they can present with erythema, very prominent vesicles, burns, as well as ocular manifestations, including conjunctivitis and chemical burns of the eyes. They can also have significant systemic toxicity as well. So mustard gas is a classic vesicle agent that has systemic toxicity as well. And it's actually structurally similar to the chemotherapy agent cyclophosphamide. This is a propaganda poster shown here from World War I describing some of the effects and attributes of mustard gas. And mustard gas was said to be a yellow brown gas that was low lying to the ground, smelled potently of garlic, horseradish, mustard, and was again a very potent vesicant agent, but also with systemic toxicity. So now transitioning to a focus on arsenical exposures and associated toxicity. When we discuss arsenical chemical weapons exposures, it's helpful to first discuss some background on arsenical exposures. The, the route of exposures in addition to the different forms of exposure that can occur. So routes of exposure, of course, are myriad. Dermal and inhalational routes are going to be the most common routes seen in chemical weapons exposures, secondary to aerialization of a chemical weapons agent. But ingestion is actually the most common route of arsenical exposure worldwide and the most well described in the literature. In areas like India and Bangladesh, millions of people have been affected from arsenical exposures, primarily from groundwater exposure. In the picture here, you see a tube well, which is a common source of arsenical laden groundwater exposure in these areas. And these exposures are usually chronic, um, slow ingestions over a long period of time, and they can have a myriad of effects, including malignancies, neurologic manifestations, respiratory manifestations, dermatologic manifestations, just to name a few things. But again, rather than focus on chronic arsenical exposures today, even though they are more prevalent worldwide, our focus is going to be on high dose acute arsenical toxicity, as well as chemical weapons derived from arsenical agents. When we discuss the different types of arsenical forms, there are two most prominent forms, organic and inorganic forms. So organic forms are by far the most common and are essentially harmless for all practical purposes. They include primarily arsenobatamine and arsenocholine, which are also known as fish arsenic. These compounds are present in a variety of seafood, including fish, bivalve bis, fish like mollusks, crustaceans, shrimp, seaweed, as well as some poultry products. And again, these are ingested, for example, if you eat a seafood meal and then harmlessly excreted from the body. Notably, they will cause a positive urinary arsenic level, which, become which will become relevant later in our discussion. Inorganic forms are gonna be the much more toxic forms. An example being arsenic trioxide, which is a white or transparent solid that forms when elemental metallic arsenic is heated to high temperatures or burn. It's used in some manufacturing processes as well as a chemotherapy agent in acute promyelocytic leukemia or APL. When arsenic trioxide is burned, it actually forms arsine gas, which can be a highly toxic compound. Arsine gas was actually tested for deployment as a chemical weapons agent during World War II, but unfortunately it wasn't found that to be that effective in deployment. Today it's actually primarily used in microelectronics and solid state lasers, 
It was described as a colorless gas, denser than air, with the odor of garlic. And if you were exposed to a high dose, it could be extremely toxic and cause multi-system organ failure and massive intravascular hemolysis. Another inorganic compound that patients may be exposed to is CCA or chromated copper arsenate. It was an arsenical compound that was designed to be used as a wood preservative, um, specifically for pressure treated wood. And it was banned, but still remains in playgrounds around the world today. And so the exposures we see with CCA today are actually most often pediatric exposures for that reason. And then of course there are lewisite and similar compounds. Lewisite is a very potent arsenical chemical weapon. Again, we're gonna focus on lewisite today as the prototype arsenical chemical weapon um, most often used in chemical warfare. Lewisite is the compound beta chlorovinyl dichloroarsenine, and it has a poorly understood mechanism of toxicity. It's thought to be a suicide inhibitor of the E3 component of pyruvate dehydrogenase, but much more research is needed in this area. And that's part of the goal of the Counteract program, as well as the UAB Research Center of Excellence in Arsenicals, to research the mechanism of toxicity of arsenical compounds and then identify areas in which we could effectively implement countermeasures. Again, there are multiple similar compounds to lewisite um, that arsenicals that we're using in chemical warfare, and they include diphenylchlorarsine, diphenylcyanoarsenine, diethylchlorarsenine, just to name a few. Lewisite is a very potent vesicant compound. Again, vesicant compounds are those compounds that are going to cause rapid, severe, and painful inflammatory and blistering responses on the skin as well as respiratory mucosa, but it also has very prominent systemic toxicity, which we'll go through in detail. It was often most, excuse me, it was most often stored as an oily, dark, or colorless liquid at low temperatures, that was, but was volatile at ambient temperatures. And it was said to have a very potent odor of germaniums. When deployed, it was described as heavier than atmospheric air and low lying to the ground, appearing as a thick fog. And here you can see another propaganda poster that describes some of the attributes of lewisite. Lewisite, like other chemical weapons, was designed to be aerosolized with an attached explosive going from a liquid to a gas that would then expose victims. Of course, for that reason, it primarily causes respiratory greater than dermal exposure, but both exposures are very important when you consider the mechanisms of toxicity. It was sometimes coupled in a dual preparation with sulfur mustard, again, another potent vesicle agent. And Ultimately, it was sometimes referred to by the nickname the dew of death by US troops. Lewisite was actually inadvertently discovered in an attempt to devise a synthetic rubber compound from acetylene by a Catholic priest and chemistry PhD student, Julius Arthur Newland, who was studying at a Catholic university in DC in the 1900s. He published his doctoral thesis, Some Reactions of Acetylene in 1904, which included the synthesis of lewisite as well as compounds lewisite two and three, some of those other compounds we mentioned earlier. And, but Father Nguyen was an honest Catholic. He felt like the world should not be exposed to this toxic product. And he filed away his thesis without widely publicizing the method for synthesis. The synthesis method was then rediscovered 13 years later in 1917, uh, pretty close to the end of World War I by Captain W. Lee Lewis, hence the name lewisite. He was a U.S. Army captain stationed at the same Catholic University as Newland, and he was searching the university archives for potential chemical weapons agents for use by the U.S. military as part of the Chemical Warfare Service Research Unit. After Lewis's rediscovery, large amounts of compound lewisite were synthesized, up to about 10 tons a day to the tune of a $60 million U.S. budget. And it was stockpiled in the United States and abroad during and after World War I. It was never deployed by the US during combat operations and was declared obsolete by the United States in the 1950s with most US stockpiles being destroyed at that time. But there have been numerous allegations of its use throughout history, with one example being that there are allegations that it was used by Japan against Chinese forces in the late 1930s. And again, there have been a number of other alleged uses of the compound. It can still be found today at US foreign munition ranges and in various stockpiles around the world. And exposures of arsenical compounds are still occurring with a few examples shown here. So there was a large volume exposure to diphenyl arsenic acid in Kamisu, Japan in 2004. A lewisite stockpile at a local naval base began to decay. That decay product, i.e. diphenyl arsenic acid, leached into the local groundwater supply and affected numerous residents of a nearby apartment building that used that groundwater supply. 
And this resulted in a number of effects on those residents, including hemorrhagic gastritis, severe dermatologic manifestations, respiratory toxicity, multiple malignancies, and long-term cognitive impairment effects. And unfortunately, many infants that were born residents in that building also went on to experience effects. Another example occurred in 2002 with a Lewis site exposure in Japan as well, when row laborers accidentally unearthed a Lewis site and sulfur mustard stockpile. Again, these agents were often combined in preparation. And this resulted in manifestations of severe vesicant toxicity with numerous road workers requiring advanced burn care and admission for systemic manifestations as well. And a final example of blue side exposure occurred in China in 2003 when 44 victims were exposed while trying to dispose of an abandoned World War II lewisite stockpile. And this event resulted in numerous casualties manifesting multi-system toxicity. And in the picture here, you can see an example of one of the victims of this exposure in China with severe vesicant toxicity. And these are just a few examples of how these exposures occur, but I think they illustrate how important it is to continue to be prepared for these exposures. So what does acute high dose arsenical or Lewis toxicity, excuse me, Lewisite toxicity look like? Well, first and foremost, you're gonna have those severe vesicant effects that we've already discussed. And you can see an example of an exposure here, but you're also gonna have a lot of systemic toxicity, which we're gonna go through in detail. And patients that have high dose acute Lewisite or arsenical exposure can be quite critically ill. The dermatologic effects can appear in seconds to minutes and can initially present as severe pain and irritation that over 15 to 30 minutes evolves into severe erythema, followed hours later with the development of vesicles and severe chemical burns. And ocular manifestations, as we discussed earlier, can also be very prevalent. Neurologic manifestations are wide ranging, but can include encephalopathy, convulsions, seizures, neuropathies. Gastrointestinal manifestations can include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, as well as hemorrhagic gastritis and high dose exposures. Cardiovascular manifestations are myriad, but can include distributive shock and cardiovascular collapse. And this is such a hallmark of the exposure that is actually referred to as Lewisite shock. Pulmonary manifestations can also be myriad, but can include mucosal irritation from those vesicant exposures to the respiratory tract, leading to wheezing, bronchorrhea, pulmonary edema, ARDS, and even frank respiratory failure. Hematologic manifestations are also wide ranging, but can include pancytopenia, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, as well as massive intravascular hemolysis in very high doses. Musculoskeletal exposures can result in rhabdomyolysis and nephrological manifestations can include hematuria, acute tubular necrosis, and can result in acute renal failure leading to emergent dialysis need. Again, patients can get very critically ill from these exposures. Now we're gonna to transition to a discussion of the initial management of chemical weapons exposure, and we'll end our discussion today with the specific management considerations in arsenical exposures. So in order to effectively manage a chemical weapons exposure, you must first recognize an exposure. And we know from historical data that a chemical warfare attack may not immediately be identified as such. Chemical weapons on the battlefield or in civilian settings are often combined with the use of other weapons, including firearms, explosives, and it can result in multiple victims who could be initially mistaken as casualties of a conventional attack, patients that have not only chemical weapons exposure toxicity, but also traumatic injuries as well. And so when first responders arrive on a scene, they have to look for specific clues for chemical weapons exposure. Things that might cue you in to chemical weapons exposure would include unexplained mass casualties without evidence of trauma, clusters of patients that are presenting with similar symptoms and a sudden onset of symptoms, and classically, that would be concerning for nerve agents, for example, or cyanide. You have to understand that things like pulmonary agents or vesicant agents may have a much longer latent period, i.e. the time before their, the time from exposure to manifestation of symptoms. Unusual fogs or smokes identified by victims or responders may also be concerning for a chemical weapons exposure. And many of the chemicals of interest are, again, going to be a gas that's low lying and heavier than atmospheric air and visible to the naked eye. Some examples are that chlorine gas might have a yellow green appearance, a very potent chlorine odor as well, 
Cyanide gas may have a bitter almond smell, although only a certain proportion of victims can actually smell that. Sulfur mustard, again, was described as a yellow, brown, foul smelling product that smelled like onions, garlic, or mustard. And again, lewisite was said to be low lying and smell potently of the odor of germaniums. Unfortunately, most nerve agents, which can be very deadly, are actually colorless and odorless. Definitive identification of these chemical agents is going to be best accomplished by biological or environmental sample analysis. And handheld devices are out there for this purpose. Unfortunately, such devices are oftentimes not going to be readily available at the outset of an attack, and many civilian areas don't necessarily have these devices. And so when you're first encountering patients that you may be concerned for a chemical weapons attack, identifying such an attack may come down to toxidrome recognition. And that's why it's really important to be able to recognize some of the toxidromes that I've already mentioned. If a chemical weapons exposure is suspected, then one of the most important things to do initially is to obtain appropriate PPE so that you can protect yourself and also deliver effective care that way. And then adequate scene staging, which we'll go through in detail, is also very important. So once it's been established that there's concern for a chemical weapons attack, the authorities, i.e. the CDC, as well as local emergency management personnel need to be notified and a chain of command needs to be established. First responders must also further try and characterize an exposure, considering whether a chemical weapons exposure may be isolated to one geographical area or has it been widely dispersed. What's the physical state of the exposure, i.e. is it a liquid exposure or a gaseous exposure, which may change management. What are the wind patterns at the site? Again, very important if you have aerosolization of a product. And what additional hazards may be present at the site of an exposure, i.e. if there were conventional weapons used like explosives, are there debris or rubble that you have to contend with? Are there downed power lines, things of that nature? And then once some initial characteristics of a potential attack are identified, appropriate PPE should be obtained and hazard control zones should be established. So hazard control zones are gonna be codified treatment areas and they're typically broken down into three zones. The hot zone is going to be nearest to the exposure and of course going to carry the highest risk for responders. And so for that reason, anyone entering into the hot zone must have appropriate PPE. In this instance, the highest level of PPE, which we'll go through is recommended level A PPE. The next zone is going to be the warm zone, also known as the decontamination corridor. This zone should be uphill and upwind of the hot zone and is designed to facilitate decontamination of patients as well as early delivery of medical care. Again, personnel in this zone should also have appropriate PPE. And then the final zone is known as the cold zone, also known as the support zone. That's where patients are going to be brought once they're free of external decontamination and they are then assessed and it may be determined at that time whether they need to be transported to definitive care, i.e. the emergency department, for example. And there can also be a command post for the field incident established in the cold zone. Again, the cold zone should ideally be upwind and greater than 150 feet or about 50 meters away from the hot zone to limit potential for exposure of the responders. Once you've employed a so appropriate scene staging and you've established hazard control zones, you've obtained PPE, there needs to be establishment of a mass casualty triage system, especially if you have a large amount of victims to take care of. And traditional mass casualty triage systems break patients down into four broad categories. Expectant, or those patients that expire whatever you will do, and those patients really need palliative care more than anything else. Patients that need immediate care or they will die. Patients that need an intervention, but that intervention can be delayed safely until a later time. And those patients that need only a minimal intervention, i.e. they have a small cut or scratch or minimal exposure and no immediate treatment is necessary or treatment can be deferred to a much later time. Unfortunately, during a chemical weapons attack, there are gonna be a lot of other considerations outside of the classic mass casualty triage considerations you need to employ, and it requires a specialized approach. Part of that includes the fact that you need PPE. So PPE can be difficult to obtain in some areas, you have to have training in donning of doffing of PPE for it to work effectively. PPE can limit communication, especially the higher levels. And there can be functional limitations in delivery of care when, we when wearing extensive PPE. And I know many of us have experienced that during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Toxidrome recognition is also going to take some time and has to occur. And toxidrome recognition can aid you in deciding if patients will be eligible for countermeasure or antidote administration, which we'll go through in some detail. Decontamination is also going to be of paramount importance in any chemical weapons exposure. And lastly, respiratory failure is going to be very common in chemical weapons exposures, especially in things like nerve agents or cyanide, for example, and it needs to be addressed very quickly. So let's dive a little bit more into a brief discussion of PPE as well as decontamination, as both of these things are of paramount importance when approaching a chemical weapons exposure. So the United States Occupational Safety and Health Administration has very well-defined recommendations for the level of PPE they recommend depending upon the degree of exposure as well as what zone you're caring for patients in. So in the hot zone, i.e. the place with the highest degree of exposure, they recommend level A PPE, which con contains a self-contained breathing apparatus, a fully encapsulating chemical protective suit, two pairs of gloves and chemical protective boots. In level C or the decon zone, excuse me, in the warm zone or decon zone, they recommend level C, which includes a powered air purifying respirator, a chemical resistant suit, two pairs of gloves, as well as chemical protective boots. And in the cold zone, they recommend at a minimum level D PPE, which includes a mask, impermeable gown or coveralls, chemical resistant boots or shoe covers, and optional gloves, hair covering, face shield, and safety goggles fairly similar to what we use in caring for our COVID-19 patients in the emergency department, for example. Here are a couple examples of PPE. Shown here is level A PPE. Again, that's going to be the highest level of PPE. So you see a self-contained breathing apparatus with a fully encapsulating chemical protective suit, two layers of gloves, chemical resistant boots. And here's an example of level C PPE. Again, recommended uses in the warm or decon zone and includes a powered air purifying respirator, a chemical resistant suit, dual gloves, in addition to chemical resistant boots. And here's a not so flattering picture of me dressed out in level C PPE in a serious infectious disease uh, team training exercise earlier this year. All right, so moving on to decontamination. Decontamination is also going to be of paramount importance in these patients. Decontamination can remove greater than 90% of an exposure. And the earlier and more comprehensively decontamination is performed, the better, because that's going to limit those downstream latent toxic effects that you can experience from many of these exposures. So there's a lot of different ways to approach decontamination, but in 2019, BARDA, or the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, came out with an evidence-based approach called PRISM, or primary response incident scene management. And the key steps are to evacuate the patient, disrobe the patient, provide emergency decon for the patient by washing them head to toe, provide gross decontamination for the patient with soap, warm water, and an absorbent cloth or substance, followed by active drying of the patient, and then providing the patient with clean garments. And here you can see a filled decontamination shower that can be deployed very rapidly in order to facilitate decontamination. Here's a summary chart of PRISM with the steps laid out in an algorithmic format that can be quickly referenced in such an event. So again, evacuate, disrobe, followed by emergency decontamination, gross decontamination, active drying, and then again, providing that patient with clean garments. And so this kind of lends itself to an algorithmic approach. So after identifying an exposure, you employ great scene management with establishing command, establishment of hazard control zones, followed by use of appropriate PPE, mass casualty triage algorithms as necessary, followed by aggressive decontamination. And then lastly, that brings us to a focus on excellent supportive care. And that should be a universal thing throughout all chemical weapons exposures. So first, of course, as we would for any critically ill patient, we would focus on securing an airway, focusing on patency, C-spine precautions, supporting the patient's breathing with oxygen, bag valve mask for ventilatory support or mechanical ventilation even as necessary, focusing on optimizing hemodynamics and the circulation, obtaining IV access, assessing the patient's neurologic status or disability with something like a GCS score or another rapid evaluation and easily communicable score. And then lastly, an additional consideration to chemical weapons exposures, thinking about are there any antidotes that need to be administered or drugs that I may need to use. Again, as we discussed earlier, this is going to come down to toxidrome recognition. 
you consider classic toxidromes as we went through. So some examples, muscle twitching, weakness or paralysis, plus increased secretions with prominent bronchorrhea may suggest that a nerve agent was used. Bradypnea or apnea combined with gas scheme, collapse, seizures, and cyanosis may support the use of asphyxiants such as cyanide. And again, if you see severe chemical burns and vesicles you may with systemic manifestations, you may consider sulfur mustard or an arsenical compound exposure such as lewisite. Again, so go through an algorithmic approach when you see these exposures. So moving on to talk a little bit about agent-specific therapies now, as well as, again, the focus on arsenical toxicity management. We'll start with the nerve agents again, as these are very prominent chemical weapons with numerous stockpiles around the world. Again, nerve agents are those agents that inhibit cholinesterase, resulting in muscarinic and nicotinic effects. And that can manifest clinically as prominent bronchorrhea with increased secretions, in addition to neurologic effects of fasciculations, weakness, seizures, paralysis. So the first countermeasure that you want to use in a nerve agent exposure is going to be atropine. Atropine is an anti-muscarinic agent that is going to be titrated to the drying of secretions and resolution of bronchorrhea in these patients. Prolidoxime is an agent, also known as 2-PAM, that can bind and restore cholinesterase activity and can be a definitive treatment, especially if used early after an exposure. Benzodiazepines can be used in these exposures for management of seizures, as well as hyperdynamic ma manifestations. And the U.S. military actually carries some of these antidotes in um, their usual kits. So, for examples, are the Mark I NAAK kit and the Canna kit. The Mark I NAAK kit or nerve agent antidote kit contains two milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of prolidoxime, which are in pre-prepared auto injectors that you see here. And the Canna kit or convulsive antidote nerve agent kit contains 10 milligrams of diazepam, which can be rapidly administered here. And nerve agent patients can become very critically ill. I've seen some similar compound exposures in my international practice of organophosphate insecticides, and these patients just decompensate extremely rapidly. Incapacitating agent examples include BZ gas, as we discussed earlier, also known as knockdown gas, is an anti-muscarinic agent that can cause medriasis, prominent delirium, tachycardia, and it can be treated with benzodiazepines to manage delirium as well as some of the tachycardia but you can also administer physostigmine, which is a muscarinic agonist that can reverse the effects of that agent. And then again, opiate agents are another incapacitating agent that can cause respiratory depression with prominent meiosis. And you can, of course, administer naloxone or Narcan. And I know many of the, us are familiar from that, or excuse me, familiar with that from our clinical practice. Other agent-specific therapies include some antidotes for cyanide. Again, cyanide is going to be an asphyxiant compound that inhibits cellular respiration and in turn can cause prodipnea, collapse, seizures, cyanosis, and prominent acidosis. Hydroxycobalamin is probably the most effective antidote for cyanide and brand name cyanokit. We use this oftentimes in our trauma bay when we have uh, burn patients that are exhibiting signs of potential cyanide poisoning. And hydroxycobalamin directly binds to intracellular cyanide and actually facilitates its harmless urinary excretion. A couple of other compounds that can be used are amyl nitrite and sodium nitrite. These actually induce methemoglobinemia. And methemoglobinemia is a very attractive binding site for cyanide. And then um, that less toxic cyanomethemoglobin complex that's formed can be excreted as well. And then sodium thiosulfate is an agent that relies on the use of sulfur donors for an enzyme rhodonese, which can detoxify cyanide. Pulmonary agents, again, are going to be those agents like chlorine, phosgene, hydrogen sulfide that can cause respiratory failure through their direct respiratory mucosal effects. But unfortunately, there's not a great countermeasure for those at this point. Respiratory supportive care is going to be the treatment of choice. And then lastly, vesicants and arsenical agents, again, are going to cause severe chemical burns as well as multi-system toxicity. And for these patients, you want to focus, focus on great burn care hemodynamic support and chelation as needed, which we'll go through in detail. So when approaching an arsenical toxicity or lewisite toxicity patient, you wanna first and foremost do the same things you would for any chemical weapons exposure. So you wanna try and identify exposure through toxic node drone recognition or testing of environmental or biological samples if time allows or you have the equipment. Employ great scene management if you're on scene with establishing 
a chain of command, employing hazard control zones with appropriate use of PPE and mass casualty triage implementation as necessary, then focus on aggressive decontamination to try and limit the downstream effects of exposure. And then again, just like you would for other chemical weapons, the initial management of arsenical toxicity is going to be focusing on excellent supportive care. So one of aspect of that may include managing the burns or vesicant exposure that these patients may experience with specialized burn care to include debridement, surgical care as necessary. You're going to need large volume fluid resuscitation for these patients oftentimes as they're going to experience a lot of insensible losses from their burns. But furthermore, they're going to have uh, oftentimes cardiovascular manifestations like distributive shock. So fluid resuscitation followed by vasopressors as warranted for management of that distributive or lewisite shock. Then these patients are going to oftentimes have acute renal failure with high dose exposure and they may even require dialysis. They may require oxygenation support in addition to ventilatory support and even mechanical ventilation in some instances. And they may require transfusion as needed for severe hemolysis and pancytopenia. Some diagnostic studies you may consider obtaining if you're in a hospital setting for arsenical toxicity would include a CBC with peripheral smear. Again, that can show some of the pancytopenia that these patients can manifest with. Hemolytic studies to assess the degree of hemolysis patients are experiencing. A renal function panel to check for AKI and renal failure. A liver function panel to check for transaminitis or hyperbilirubinemia. An EKG can be important as well, as these patients can experience abnormalities in cardiac conduction, and that's especially prominent when these patients are manifesting with that lewisite shock. A radiograph should be obtained of the chest to assess for pulmonary toxicity. In addition, a KUB or abdominal radiograph can be obtained, especially if you're concerned for arsenical ingestion, as arsenic is, again, a metal, uh, metallic compounds are formed from it, it's radio-opaque, and you may consider whole bowel irrigation if you see radio opaque um, arsenic ingestion. Urinary arsenic management, or excuse me, urinary arsenic measurement is going to be the definitive way to diagnose an arsenical exposure, but obviously that's not going to be very helpful in the short term, and there are going to be a lot of confounders with that. For example, dietary organic arsenicals will also cause a positive urinary arsenic level, but it can be a helpful way to confirm the diagnosis. Arsenical blood level testing, unfortunately, is not helpful as arsenic is actually rapidly cleared from the blood. And when you think about different innovations that would be helpful in the management of our arsenic toxicity, a rapid diagnostic test or some way to rapidly um, analyze environmental or biological samples would be very helpful. It's important to note that any patient that has systemic manifestation should receive chelation therapy. Recall again that arsenic is a heavy metal compound that responds favorably to chelation. And the primary benefit of chelation therapy is going to be to mitigate uh, manifestations of multi-system toxicity, as well as limit some downstream effects of toxicity. And for that reason, the earlier that chelators are initiated, the more effective they're going to be. Chelation agents, unfortunately, again, only work on the multi-system toxicity effects. They don't really work well on the vesicant effects of the compound. So they're not going to help with those focal lesions in the skin, eyes, or airways that patients may experience. Classically, the recommended chelation agent was dimercaprol or BAL, also known as British anti-lewisite. And BAL was actually developed in secret in the 1940s by the British government as an arsenical countermeasure. And it was initially touted as an effective antidote for lewisite exposure. Unfortunately, dimercaprol was only marginally effective in and of itself. And it also has high toxicity. It can cause renal failure that can require hemodialysis. Again, that's not going to be advantageous in a patient that's had high dose arsenical exposure and already having severe renal failure. It requires IM administration and it is contraindicated in any patients with a history of CKD or chronic kidney disease or pregnant patients. The CDC actually recommends using DMPS or DMSA, also known as succimer, um, as a chelation, chelation agent of choice because it's water soluble, has high oral bioavailability and somewhat lower toxicity than BAL. And from my understanding, uh, DMPS is available here at UA UAB. DMSA is not, you know, there are going to be a lot of facilities out there that don't necessarily carry DMPS or DMSA. Many facilities do carry BAL. It just is region and facility specific. But again, our primary focus in these patients initially is going to be excellent supportive care and then chelation kind of as needed for systemic manifestations. Lastly, we'll discuss the disposition of patients with arsenical toxicity. 
And that's primarily going to be determined by how symptomatic patients are. But certainly any patient that is manifesting systemic toxicity and any patient that undergoes chelation should be admitted. And that's primarily because if these patients are exhibiting symptoms of systemic toxicity at the outset, then they're likely going to get much worse before they improve. And that's primarily because arsenical compounds have a long half-life and numerous latent toxic effects. And as previously mentioned, timely chelation therapy, i.e. as early as possible in patients with systemic manifestations of toxicity, um, can reduce the occurrence of these delayed effects, but these patients should be monitored very closely, oftentimes in an ICU setting if they have multi-system toxicity. Asymptomatic patients should undergo a six to eight hour observation at a minimum before being discharged. Again, delayed effects of exposure to these compounds are going to be myriad. And delayed effects are far ranging. They include peripheral neuropathy, cognitive impairment, bone marrow suppression, some of that pancytopenia we discussed earlier, cardiomyopathy, as well as dermatologic lesions and an increased risk for numerous malignancies, just to name a few things. Again, the delayed toxicity is gonna to be similar to what we've observed in those chronic exposure patients in India and Bangladesh. Also recall that Veskin effects can be delayed from the time of exposure, and it can take up to 18 hours to fully develop ocular burns and um, severe skin burns. All discharge patients should be provided with a 24 to 48 hour follow-up plan. And at that 24 hour to 48 hour follow-up visit, you know, they need to be re-examined head to toe, searching for multi-system effects of toxicity, and they may need to have some testing done, including a 24-hour urinary arsenic level, a CBC, hepatic function panel, renal function panel, some of those same things we mentioned that could be um, performed in the acute setting. And again, even patients who only have mild skin burns or corneal lesions should be re-examined within 24 hours. So that brings us to our conclusion. You know, in conclusion, be prepared. These exposures still are occurring around the world. Know the presenting signs of chemical weapons agents and be able to recognize some of the classic toxidromes. Know the basic measures of scene management, i.e. establishing command, establishing a field response and hazard control zones with appropriate mass casualty triage. Understand that aggressive decontamination is one of the mainstays of treatment for these patients and utilization of appropriate PPE is of paramount importance to protect yourself and your colleagues and understand that supportive care is going to be the first approach to any of these chemical weapons agents with followed by a rapid focus on agent specific therapies and appropriate countermeasures if appropriate. And then if these exposures occur, certainly consult your regional poison center, they can help you out. They can provide a lot of useful information, certainly report exposures to a governmental organization such as the CDC that can provide further recommendations as well as governmental support. All right, that's it for my talk. Any questions? Yes. Um, yes, if anyone has any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A field. And we do have a few in there right now. Um, the first, is Duodote still available? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the compound Duodote. And what type of oil is used uh, in BAL? That was another question. So I'm not certain what uh, type of oil it's immersed in. Um, it is in an oil preparation for intramuscular injection primarily, but I'm not sure exactly what type of oil it's prepared in. Is there a formal strategy to stratify victims according to severity of exposure or symptoms? And is there a concern of secondary toxicity from exposed ill-managed patients? So that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, there for arsenical exposures specifically, there has not been a well-codified way to stratify victims and according to their severity of exposure. Certainly, you know, if patients just have minor signs of vesican toxicity, i.e., you know, perhaps superficial corneal burns or a small area of dermatologic exposure without manifestations of systemic toxicity, we know that those patients are going to do better. But if patients are manifesting any of those multi-system toxic effects, including cardiovascular manifestations or respiratory manifestations, renal manifestations, et cetera, those patients are going to warrant closer observation. They're going to warrant chelation and they're going to be much more critically ill overall. In regards to secondary toxicity, I mean, absolutely with any chemical weapons exposure, if there is residual compound on a patient's skin or, um, on the rest of their body, then certainly you could be exposed. That's why appropriate and aggressive decontamination are of paramount importance in addition to utilization of appropriate PPE when caring for these patients.
And duodote is the combination of 2-PAM and atropine in the auto injector. So is that similar to Mark I kits? Yes. So the Mark I kit actually is a preparation of two separate auto injectors. Um, again, two milligrams of atropine followed by polydoxime. And then in addition, um, that Canna kit is present as well, which is diazepam. Okay. How, how prevalent are those with the first responder community? I know here in Alabama, when we had um, nerve agents being in, um, destroyed in Anniston, you know, all the fire departments around the area and even here in the Birmingham area were given those kits, but I'm sure all of those are expired by now. And I don't, I don't know how prevalent they are or how accessible they are to first responders. Unfortunately, I know that some EMS uh, personnel do carry those. I think it is, you know, service dependent. Certainly, there are strategic national stockpiles throughout the country that have a large stockpile of those countermeasures available. Certainly, we have those countermeasures available at UAB and other hospitals do as well. But again, I think it's going to be dependent upon each EMS service. And then one question on the chelation agents that you mentioned. Um, you said it was advised to be given as soon as possible, but then you also mentioned the fact that there's still a need for rapid diagnostics to be able to know if our cynicals are involved um, as far as environmental contamination or human exposure. So will these chelation agents be uh, effective if it's de given delayed? So the earlier they're given, the more effective they're going to be. And that's primarily because as arsenicals are taken up into the body, you know, they're not going to be available to be chelated. And so the sooner you give them, the more effective they're going to be and their effectiveness will decrease, you know, the longer you wait before giving them. And unfortunately, that's one of the limitations in caring for these patients. It can be a difficult toxidrome to recognize. It can be a difficult toxidrome to differentiate um, from, for example, from sulfur mustard, which is another common vesicant agent. And again, you know, sulfur mustard and lewisite dual preparations are out there as well. So that can be a challenge. It truly comes down to if you, you know, have suspicion for an arsenical exposure, chelation therapy is certainly indicated, especially in a critically ill patient or a patient with multi-system toxicity. Okay. And then one question from Matthew Mayfield, how would you suggest starting treatment in the field if there is a transport delay? So again, field treatment is going to first focus on, you know, scene safety. So wearing PPE for yourself, and then also establishment of hazard control zones, notifying authorities as we discussed. But in regards to a one-on-one -on -one treatment approach, it's going to be providing aggressive decontamination first and foremost, followed by immediately or soon thereafter with stabilization of the patient, focusing again on those kind of classic hallmarks of airway, breathing, circulation. But decontamination is going to be just so important because if you remove, you know, as much of the exposure as you can, that's going to limit the downstream effects of toxicity. And then one more question, and, and then our time will be about up, but um, has ricin been used as a bioweapon, and what is this toxidrum? Are you familiar with ricin? I am familiar with ricin. Um, in regards to a specific toxidrome, I know it can have multi-system effects, and most often those are going to be delayed effects unless it's in an aerosolized preparation, which to my knowledge, there's no known aerosolization, excuse me, aerosolized preparations that have been deployed in combat operations. But um, I know that it has been used in a few assassination attempts, for example. Ricin is a toxic compound that's, um, you know, derived from castor beans. But in regards to the specifics of the toxidrome and, you know, the specifics of acute high dose ricin exposure, I'm not as familiar with that. And then the only other thing is there's a comment that BAL contains peanut oil. Several folks have. And that might rain, you know, raise some interesting concerns in patients with a pre-existing peanut allergy. allergy. Again, if you do have DMPS or DMSA succimer available, that uh, can be given as an oral preparation. I'm not sure if it does contain uh, peanut but it might be something to consider in a patient that has a history of anaphylaxis to those agents. And I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. We've had lots of comments about how great this presentation has been, and we really appreciate your time and everyone's time for signing on and attending. Thank you everyone for tuning in, and I very much appreciate your time.